This is Ralph L. Crowder III, um, here uh, live on location at Coppin State for the screening of Hands Up, Don't Shoot Our Youth Movement. So I'm, I'm just going to go back to the beginning, you know, just so, uh, just get all the nuts and bolts and stuff like, uh, so how, you know, are you a filmmaker already? Did you start, you know, you have your live background film and you were doing this? Yeah, you, I'm, a, I'm a survivor, so um, utilizing the tool of uh, media, uh, film, video, uh, the written word, um, speaking, you know, that's that's kind of um, my skill set. And um, I'm an independent journalist, you know, basically. And um, that is uh, essential right now, especially uh, the issues that we see in our communities, the lack of ownership, the lack of uh, independent media um, to interpret our stories and, um, you know, communicate our issues uh, in a way that is an alternative mode of uh, using our sensories, you know. And that's the power of film, that's the power of video, and uh, that's what we try to do uh, with Hands Up, Don't Shoot Our Youth Movement. My name is Damian Poole, I'm a uh, graduate and senior here at Coppin State University. Um, uh, I'm here uh, with uh, two members of the uh, SGA here, and um, we were, you know, just walking by and we figured we'd come and, and support the event for students. I just want y'all to, um, you know, I, I tell, you know, my friends all the time, my goal uh, while, while I was here at Coppin was to um, be as impactful as possible and get people to understand that things happen for a reason. Like, y'all didn't just come to this movie for, without a purpose. Like, whether you were, you know, initially connected to it, like my brother right here, Shaquille Carbon, our SGA president, he was maced during the Freddie Gray uprisings. You know what I'm saying? Like, y'all have, you know, walking, breathing proof of a brother who just minding his business and trying to put on for the university being, you know, brutally assaulted by a police officer who had no idea the connection and, and the purpose of his being, right? And it's so many people out here who don't have an idea of what your purpose of your being is going to be. Right. So you have to determine that for yourself. Right? I'm not for the, 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 the babying or, or, or giving people handouts. I'm more of, yo, you got to create a grind and a hustle for yourself. Mm -hmm. You got to make something that makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. Education is not, education is the end all be all because without intelligence, without communication, reading and writing, you won't progress. Mm -hmm. But the main course is for you to develop something that's progressive for you, to develop a family, to create a community. And we have to, we, we have to get back to that. And it, it all starts with you. Some of you were taking the film very, very seriously. I was sitting right in front of folks right there, and there were some very serious conversations going on. Kent, do you mind talking about the images of the police with the white men and what you were talking about and thinking and the differences? I'm, I know I'm putting you on the spot. Okay. If like the one white guy when he was naked and how like he was just running around they tased him they were like well it would have been different he was, he was a black man he was naked like they wouldn't have talked to him wouldn't have tased him they just pulled out the gun and shot him point blank and it would be done with uh the other guy who we was carrying the rifle the first time uh, when like the girl the girl on the phone they just called 911 says well it was a Caucasian male he didn't see any police come by or nothing nothing happening but like, a guy called and just said that it was a man out there with, with a, an assault rifle and the police show up and they're all talking to him like, hey, can I talk to you? Uh -huh. And like, buddy, buddy with them. It's like, nah, if that was a black guy out there and you say, oh, yeah, you got a disturbed neighborhood black guy out here and he has a gun. Please show up, have the gun drawn already and tell him to put the gun down like maybe once and then they would shoot him. Mm -hmm. You even identified the moment when he would have been shot yeah. in the conversation. because, And that was one of the things that happened when I saw the film for the first time. I realized that I was holding my breath mm -hmm. uh, and waiting. And then when it didn't happen, because I, I turned around and you were like, what? <laughs> I'm not just you. I mean, like the whole little row was like, and somebody said, black man would have been shot just then. You knew the moment. We've internalized damage that we don't even know we've internalized. And, and they, were, they, were, they were doing film, and they were digesting it the whole mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, I think even the laughter is telling, because sometimes laughter is, I'm not going to deal with this right now. Yeah. 
it's, it's a pushing away. Did anybody have that feeling? It's like, I, I can't deal with this right now. I don't want to deal with this right now. Yeah. Don't be yeah. scared to speak up and say what you need yeah. to say. Stand up. I can Stand up. Speak up just a little bit so I can hear you, please. I don't feel like laughing is a way to push something away from you. I think more so when you smile is something to push away from you or to show that you're not in pain. But laughter is a sign of you humiliating yourself or you not showing sympathy for others and showing the true character that you are in certain situations. Like when I hear people laugh, I don't, especially in serious situations, I don't feel as though it's funny. I don't feel as though it's something to laugh about. I don't feel as though it's something that you should sit here and laugh with your friends about because same way if that was you, you would have been crying or if that was your homeboy, you would have been crying. If that was your homegirl, you would have been crying in tears. There's nothing to laugh about. We sit here every day in class and laugh. Not, not even just everybody, but I myself. I can sit in class and laugh, but in a matter of fact, like in a matter of reality, you have to think about kids who don't get their education. So sometimes I don't see, see it as a laughing matter because it's not. And you're humiliating yourself. You can sit here and laugh and pay attention to stupid things on social media, pay attention to friends who make jokes that's not even funny. To me, I find the corniest things funny, but when it comes to serious situations, sorry, that I'm serious. But it's things that you do not laugh about. It's, serious. it's situations that you take serious and that you take into your own hands to deal with sometimes. Sometimes I look at people and wonder why do they laugh. Because I don't feel as though it's something to push yourself away from. I feel as though when, when I get mad, I could just smile. Or I walk away. Or I don't say nothing at all. But if I feel as though I have to laugh, no. Because I feel as though it could, anything could happen at any time. So I don't sit here and laugh or sit here and giggle. I take things serious and I take it in and live with it. You know, sometimes I can joke a lot, I can play a lot, but I know when it's like time to become serious and like in school, like you know, it's like an hour for each class. So I might get my work done first and then I would actually like have my time of laughter and jokes and stuff, but I, I get my work done. And that makes you feel like you're in control? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like uh, a lot of people out of school, they don't really take their future that seriously. Because, you know, especially a lot of the underclassmen, it's like they just feel like, oh, you know, like it's going to be a breeze high school, just like middle school, just like elementary school. Like they just don't see it as seriously. But it's like, for me, it's like I always think about my future at hand. Like I understand that I'm not in a situation where I have a lot of financial opportunities. But it's like the only thing that has got me a lot of a uh, lot of things that would usually cause people a lot of money has been my education or like my grades or my GPA and stuff. And it's like a lot of people just see it as, um, oh, you know, like they just surrounded by the stuff that's going in school instead of being instead of being worried about the things that's going to come at the school because high school only lasts four years. You know, like a lot of the kids that a lot of people GPAs are even below a 2.5 and that's like like the graduating minimum is like a 2.5. And for me, it's like really sad because I just constantly keep that in the back of my head, like my future, my future, me growing up, me growing up, because this is going to have everybody after me is like going to be impacted by the things that I do now. Um, I just have one question. So I was watching the video and most of that imagery I had not seen. I hadn't seen, I don't know that I'd seen any of it. And that's partly because I don't watch TV. I listen to radio. I don't like to look at that imagery. <laughs> very difficult to watch it, I, you know I felt very sick watching it and in a good way watching right. the video. Um, well my question for you all is how much uh, how much of the imagery had you all seen had you seen that stuff what had you seen and what had you not seen what was new and what he brought to you because he was part of his point in there is, is like the, the title of the video was like showing the, the untold story right um, so what had you not seen? Were you surprised by what you saw or did you sort of know it already? <coughs> yeah. You know, I have seen one where uh, the police came right in front of the lady that had been attacked. She was like doing it in punch and face several times. Oh, that was in California, yep. Mm hmm Yep. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> what about you, you know? Um, for me, I think that this was a part of your, your movie though. It was the, um, yeah, yeah, it was. It wasn't a video. It was with the Caucasian man talking. Uh -huh. okay. I don't know, I felt like, like I hear about a lot of that stuff because it's like, um, 
I'm like connected with a lot of like groups here in Baltimore that they used to do the advocacy and make uh, films and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I never had heard anything like that before when he was talking about how you know his connections with people is like he it felt like he even had like an internal struggle on like what is right and what is wrong. It's like he even said like he had some of the people like he grew up with and it's like they were kind of racist. How many of y'all have uh, saw the dog scene? Had seen it before. Had seen it before or heard about it. So, so, so did, did you understand the symbolism of the dog scene? Yes. Okay, somebody break that symbolism down that hasn't spoke yet. Anybody who hasn't spoke yet? Media is a very important tool, and I think we have to approach media as a tool um, in, in, in many communities that have next to minimal resources. So the tool of media um, is going to actually allow this particular film to bridge some relationships in, in, in the communities and discussions in the communities that need to be had. And I think we saw that here today, especially with the youth that watched the film from the high school that was right connected to Coppin State University. Um, you know, man, our, man, our youth need to speak, man. It's how the Baltimore, it's like kill to be killed because you got to worry about more than just police officers. You could walk down the street and you make a mistake and bump into somebody and they just blow your brains off for no reason. So the way I feel like, the way certain people feel like in Baltimore, they don't want to go to cop and talk to them. They want to leave here because they feel like here is where hell is. This is where hell is. It's real. When you walk outside, trust and believe. I got people on my block living just with BGF and all that. You get smart with them, you will get killed. That's how it is out here. I got uncles in jail. My uncle just passed away because the police thought he had a weapon, but he had a hella and they shot him. So the way I feel about it is I want to be a lawyer, a criminal defense lawyer, but the way I feel like is I want to leave here. I, I hate Baltimore. I really do hate Baltimore. That's why I want to leave here. I don't they like it. They need you here, bro. Like, if you leave here, who else is advocating for these people? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I, I hate to keep going, but it's it's just the reality of it all, right? We have this thing where people are getting these these degrees and being educated in Baltimore, and they leave, and they take those resources and everything that they gain from the city, and they go elsewhere, and the city remains the same. You got people that lived in Baltimore 30, 40 years ago. And they come back to Baltimore and they be like, you know what? The city is still the same. Ain't nothing changed. And that's because people are people have that same kind of, of thinking. I'm not saying don't leave Baltimore and gain experience and gain those opportunities. What I am saying is you got family members that live here. You got people that, that you know that are friends that are invested in these communities. And it is our due diligence as black men to come back and re and revitalize these communities and do it in a manner that's productive. So I don't want you to I don't want you to run away from the issue. I want you to take that on as a challenge and be able to take on that issue and, and try to make a change to that. But what you gotta understand is when you when you're in, when you're situated in the in the in the exact same circumstances that you that you feel have been an oppressor to you or, or have depressed you. It's a it's a constant reminder that you have an obligation to get to, to, to get the proper resources you need to get the education you need to learn the knowledge you need to, you need to learn in order to give back and invest back into that. Because sometimes a lot of times as, as Damien was saying, like a lot of people will they'll leave town and sometimes for the very reason they left town to get certain resources or to gain a certain knowledge, they, they become lost in the establishment of, of some oftentimes maybe PWIs or even even at an HBCU if you if you get too disconnected from the focus that you went there to get an education to get back to a particular community. If you lose that, if you lose that focus, then then how can you get back on track to make sure that you're properly still in line with the goal you set? So although sometimes I do I do wish I was in a different I was I, I would have had the opportunity to leave Baltimore, it's also a good reminder that you know, you know, my family's twenty minutes away. You know, I can, I can still see the reality of, of trapping on no heaven. When I go back home to East Baltimore, I can still see the reality of of, of boarded up homes. I can still see the reality of, of friends who who I love to death, but the, but because they didn't take advantage of some of the opportunities that I did, like you know, they they they're miserable, and a lot of t a lot of times they fall into the same traps that I, that I went to cop and they get away from. Like it's it's okay if you um what's, what's your name? You. Okay, uh, it, it's okay if you wanna if you wanna leave. In my perspective, because I feel I, I lost two cousins last year after the Freddie Gray uprising. Both of them shot down in the streets. So for me, I want to leave Baltimore too. But the important thing is, if you leave, you got to make a commitment to come back. Cause I want to be an attorney, just like you want to be an attorney. And my man's right here want to be an attorney too. I'd be damned if I go to law school in Baltimore, UB or University of Maryland. So I'm gonna go somewhere else to go to law school. But the intent is always gonna be to come back.
like Shaquille when Damien was telling you, if, if you want to get away, by all means, just don't forget why you left and always come back. Coming, like, looking from the county into the city, it's, like, so different. Um, but, I mean, now that I do live here and I go to the, I go to the city school now and I'm part of it, like, you realize that uh, county funding is a lot different. The money goes straight to the schools, goes straight to the people. You have all these resources. City, uh, I came here, I was wondering, like, why is it so different? Why are the funding so, like, they are cut short? And then, like, you go and, like, you talk to, like, the people that are um, a part of the council, like, for the Baltimore City, the Baltimore City Council, they'll say that, oh, it's because the kids there aren't, like, the city, they say that the, city's, the city kids are not as smart as the county kids. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, is not true. Yeah. Right. And then they also say that it's because you go into the city, everything's so messed up, and it's bad, whereas the county, is, it's better, <coughs> and the kids are smarter, and it's like, well, why are you just judging the kids, though? Because isn't the adults supposed to be the foundation? They set the foundation for everything. Mm -hmm. So you're blaming it on the kids, but the kids haven't had a chance yet. Like what the young lady said, you know, they assume that we're not as intelligent as, you know, other people. And sometimes that kind of follows you. You go to an HBCU, they think that, you know, black students at HBCUs aren't as intelligent as, uh, you know, black students or students at PWIs. But then you look at the data, HBCU graduates outperform black graduates from um, PWIs. And that's a predominantly white institution. And that's not what I'm saying. That's what the data suggests. But if you can, like, get into the algebra project, you know, learn some math or what have you. And, like, listen. I used to hate math when I was in high school. When I came to Coppin, I, I, I realized that black people invented math. The first forms of mathematics found in, the, in, in this world that we, can, that, that we can prove came out of Africa. You know what I mean? The Egyptians aligned the pyramids that they were building with freaking stars that were in outer space. And now people today are trying to figure out just how in the hell did they do this? You look at the Congo people in West Africa, you know, there's a star called Sirius, um, what is it, Sirius A, Sirius B, or what have you. The people in the Congo, black people, hundreds of years ago, knew about these stars in outer space. And white people were like, how in the hell do you know about these stars? White people didn't know that the stars really existed until they invented the telescope and they could see the stars. And then they asked this man in an interview, this French anthropologist went to the Congo and asked this black man in the Congo, how did y'all know about the stars? Do you know what the uh, man from the Congo said? He said, because we've been there before. You know what I mean? You got to understand how deep that is. But if you can like, and, and real, real quick with the Algebra Project, I don't want to take up too much time. The Algebra Project is started by a man named Robert Moses, who was a part of an organization called SNCC back in the day, which stands for the Student Nonviolent, with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, a, a, an organization that Brother Stokely Carmichael was in. If you don't know that name, Stokely Carmichael, when you get out of here, Google Stokely Carmichael. That's a, a brother that you want to know, a graduate of Howard University. But um, and and after SNCC, you know, dissolved or what have you, Bob Moses realized that. In order for black people to be able to think critically, in order for us to be on a level playing field while counterparts, math and algebra is something that we have to conquer and, 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 and be able to um, pretty much do as well as our other counterparts. Thus, he started the Algebra Project and the Baltimore Algebra Project. We actually created an advocacy component. So we're the only Algebra Project in the country because it's a national organization that actually does youth advocacy. So you mentioned Stokely Carmichael for all the high school students in here by a show of hands. How many of y'all knew who Marcus Garvey was by the show of hands? When it was mentioned in the film. Yeah. Marcus Garvey who was mentioned in the film. Wait, keep your hands up. Who heard of Marcus Garvey before? Oh, wow. Okay. Y'all got some work to do. Yeah, y'all got some work to do. Oh, really? Yeah. Y'all got some work to do. All right. Like he said earlier, you can't have somebody articulating your story for you. You can't have somebody speaking for you or speaking for your experience. Because what happens is when it's time to allocate funds, and when it's time to make programs, your story isn't being heard. So those people who may be experiencing the same things aren't going to be able to be have their 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 situations heard either, right? So you want to make sure that when you're in these spaces, when you're in these rooms with people who may got money or may have a little bit of affluence or may be in a space where they can help you, you need to be able to open your mouth and speak. Y'all telling us to get a voice and have a voice and stuff. But when they look at us, they look at us as statistics. Like... Okay. The government or whoever, okay. like well, we I don't look at you like that. You right, okay. but if okay, say right. for instance we have teachers, right? Okay. All right, we have teachers. Uh -huh. So if we tell them how we feel, like they feel as though our voice doesn't matter. Our principal, yeah. we tell them we want different things to happen. We tell them things. It's a whole bunch of people in this room that go to our principal and tell us, tell them how we feel and how we want everything to be, and our voice doesn't matter. So when y'all telling us to speak up. It still feels like even when we do speak up, our opinion doesn't matter to nobody. That's when you write. 
Mm. Learn how to write your feelings. And remember the woman who says it's, it's chess, not checkers? Do you know what she meant by that? Yeah. What does she mean? Somebody? And strategize. And figure out, and if you feel you're not being heard here, if you write it, you will be heard mm -hmm. in another way. Does that make sense? Yes. And how many of y'all got these? Huh? Or you know, you know people who got these, right? Documentation, yeah, man. Yeah, this is, this is your, you're your own news station. Mm -hmm. So let's just say, uh, y'all, I went to my teacher, I told her, I said, you know what, we don't know about Marcus Garvey in this class. I don't understand why we keep on learning about Abraham Lincoln, and we don't know who Marcus Garvey is, or Sophie Carmichael, or whoever. I want more history in my class, because I think that's what I want to see. I'm not saying that's what you want. Right. But I went to my teachers, okay. And notice what just happened. You spoke up. Right. Because mm -hmm. there are, how many adults here who don't, I mean, who are from somewhere else who are here because we put together a program for you. Yes. And we heard you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be here if, if y'all, if Baltimore didn't speak up. Don't feel that your voice doesn't matter, but also get with other people who appreciate your voice too. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you how much it matters because the reason Charles is filming is, I mean, the whole film will be available and people are watching them. We know somebody from Boston just emailed us the other day to come watch the film. But then we're going to edit them down and put them on the educational website so teachers across the country can better teach about race and power. So you have an audience. Your voice matters, don't you? You know, life is a spiritual, uh, spiritual experience. And uh, I, I found myself... Uh, in a moment of just really feeling the spirit of Baltimore, uh, feeling the spirit of uh, the community, feeling the spirit of, of the children that, or the, the youth who uh, attended this particular session today, reflecting on my own kids, on my own journey. Um, and sometimes, man, that spirit moves you, you know what I'm saying? And this is an emotional thing. You know, our families are in pain. You know what I'm saying? But there's a lot of joy in that pain, too. And so, um, you know, we're emotional people. And, um, you know, that was just a, you know, a place where that emotion really, you know, hit me in a real special spot because I think that we're servants. Those of us who do this um, and we're not doing it for money, you know, we do it because we're committed to uh, tell the stories. Um, we know that these stories represent real people, real experiences. And usually the best storytellers are the ones who are vulnerable enough, or the best artists, uh, are vulnerable enough to, to live uh, much of the experiences of the people that they um, are dedicated to actually preserve stories for. For me, I constantly put myself in a space of like, yo, that could be me. Mm -hmm. Like, some of y'all are 17, 18 years old in here. Mike Brown could have been you. Mm -hmm. Freddie Gray could have been you. Sandra Bland could be you. So you have to constantly think like that. Like, this could be me. I need to internalize these things and start thinking about ways that I can solve these issues on a larger scale. Right? So I want y'all to really take, I want y'all to take this experience with you, and I want you to value it. You know what I'm saying? I want y'all to really hone into the fact that this, this is, is way deeper than just a film. Like, this is people's lives. Like, these are people that are really hurt. We hurt. We still hurting. It's been a year after the Freddie Gray um, situation, and we still hurting. North Avenue ain't got no better. You know what I'm saying? Y'all need to really start thinking about these things. How is it that all of this money is coming into the city, but they still trapping on North and Bitlow? Okay. That these businesses that's been burnt down have not reopened. Where's all this money going? Oh. Like y'all need to really start thinking about that, especially my seniors in here. Y'all about to graduate. Y'all about to y'all about to go to college or go out into the real world. Y'all need to start developing solutions within yourselves to try to solve these problems. And I would also say, don't be that Freddie Gray. Don't be the Mike Brown. Don't be the Sandra Bland. Don't bring. Don't be any of those other names in your classroom. Because you get killed in your classroom first, before the street. And many times we kill ourselves. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, so sir. when so when you when you learning how to do what you need to do to survive, don't don't get shot in the classroom. Because I'm telling you, you put yourself in a bad position 
when you leave that classroom and you don't need to get and, and you don't get what you need, you put yourself in a very dangerous situation when you go out there on them streets. As my point of view, like when I go to school, I kind of, I'm kind of, people see me as aggressive because sometimes I look at a male and be like, he has kind of more power than me. His voice is more powerful than mine. So sometimes I see when males don't always speak up at times and it may always be a female that always has to speak up. I see that y'all have power, like it's power in your voice, y'all have Y'all could speak for others, and you could always speak for somebody else. So I don't always see it as everybody don't always have to sit down, but I see it as a male since everybody always looks up to that male. Like if you don't have a father figure, it's more say, oh, your life is crazy or it gets hacked if you don't have a father figure, and you do this and you do that just because you don't have a father figure. So I think it's like I think of it as like you look up to a male to lead the way. So I think more males should always, like I like how he always spoke up and said what's on his mind, so I believe that males should always speak up and say what they believe in. Um, I don't have a mother figure or a father figure. I'm just by myself, I have a grandmother. But I don't seem like, I still push myself to like move on and keep moving and keep going and accomplish my goals. Cause I'm never not there, she never there. It's my, it's my grandmother that's there and always there for me and helping me out and telling me keep pushing and keep going for your goals. And the people who have their mother and their father, I don't know how I feel. I wanna know how I feel. Cause I don't have her. And she don't, I talk to her, she said, I talk to her, but she not there really how she's supposed to be. I have, I'm the only girl out of her, my, my, her and my father. My father have, my father have seven kids. And I'm the only girl out of all his kids. And my mother, she just had a baby. And she put more into that baby than she did with me ever. She did. So I seem so I'm so happy and proud of myself that I'm here today and at a good school, that I have black people surrounded by me, African Americans. I'm just just proud to be here. We should be Okay. Um everybody's voices, I think what the final lesson is everybody's voice is important and everybody has it within them to break through the cycle. I'm going to give Ralph the last word. Um, thank you. Like I said, this was for y'all. And I think, really, I appreciated this conversation mo more than actually I appreciated the movie because I got a chance to feel y'all. Like y'all got a chance to feel the movie, hopefully. And uh, thank you also to the people that um, allowed this to come to this beautiful university that's been built off of the backs of a lot of people's struggle. Thank you for um, the people that have funded this, you know what I'm saying, that allowed us to come here and, and breathe some conversation. And, and I want everybody, again, two things. The people, especially the young brothers, get these people's numbers, man. You feel me? Get their numbers, because I, I know that they're servants and they're here for you. And, and the sisters, if y'all, if y'all, or anybody, if y'all have anybody, uh, any need for any questions for those people that have walked the steps that many of y'all are able to walk, don't be afraid to go and, and ask Mrs. Park some questions or any, anybody here, okay? And then last thing, could we all just take a group picture outside? Okay. Yeah. That's how you know he's family right there. Yeah,